The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Crashing Glass podcast. This is Jill Hindley from Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm here today to talk about women and body image. Unfortunately, we're missing our fabulous host, co-host Holly Hurley, who is traveling um, for the week, but we have a great guest co-host today, and she's going to help us discuss body image, and we we have um, decided that body image for women really can be an issue from maybe starting from age 8 all the way to age 98. So we think it's a hot topic, and I'd like to say hello to Jessica Moskowitz. She is a AceNet TV producer and host. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Jill. Thanks for having me on the show today. Oh, so glad you're here. <laughs> And then we'll also, I'd like the two, our two women to, to talk a little bit about what they do and what they've done. And our guest today is Monica Rowland from Seattle, Washington. She's joining us on the phone. Um, she's a high school health teacher, a personal trainer, and as well as an all-around nutrition guru. And body image, I know, women and body image is a hot topic for her that I know she's done a lot of thinking about. Hi, Monica. Hi, Jill. Thanks for having me on today. Oh, so like, glad to have you. Um, like Jill said, I've been a high school health teacher and a personal trainer since 1994, and body image is certainly um, a huge obstacle, I would say, for all of my female clients that I train as adults, um, as well as the teenagers when as their body image is changing and they're growing and their self-esteem and their social health and all that stuff is kind of being set in the foundation um, from ages, you know, 14 to 18, from freshman year to senior year in high school, so something I feel pretty passionate about, and also at the same time, sometimes powerless to change, so it's a good, a good thing that the more people talk about it and get it out there, I think the more we can help teens um, develop into healthy, healthy human beings that view themselves in a positive light rather than in such a negative light that gets pushed by the media sometimes. Right. So when you say that you don't feel, um, it almost feels almost like too powerful to change, you're talking about teenage girls and they're already so sad uh, with a negative body image. Well, I just, yeah, I think it's, the problem is, is that they are looking at Hollywood and movies and magazines and all those kinds of things from a young age. And um, that just gets really kind of programmed in their heads um, as they're growing up you know, on TV shows, everything from such a young age that that's what they sort of look to as a image of what they want to look like or what they should look like or what is pretty or, you know, that kind of thing. And um, one of the most impactful things that I've shown kids when I teach them in the health unit is a clip that I have from a video from a long time ago, but it um, shows how the computer guy's job, you know, when you're doing a magazine layout or anything that they take, you know, these supermodels that are the top, what, genetically blessed 1% of the population. And they do the photo shoot, and even then, they still go in from the computer and they will tuck in the waist, bring, you know, nip in the waist and make the girl's boobs bigger and make change her hair, change her nose smaller, all of these things that they do, these subtle things, so that even when you get a final shoot of a magazine, you're not actually even seeing what the model actually looks like. So they're improving upon, you know, those top 1% of models, and that is super unrealistic um, for girls to be growing up and seeing that. So it's just, it's, when I show them that on the clip, and they see that, and then they know, and I really emphasize to them that going forward, when you look at a magazine, when you're looking on Hollywood, when you're looking, you know, at movies and all that kind of stuff, that you have to remember that they don't even look like that, and they are, you know, the professionals out there that we deem to be the most beautiful people in society, and they even don't look like that themselves. So I think it's really right. empowering for them to kind of see that and know that. It doesn't change the fact that they're still seeing those images all the time, but at least to understand that what they're looking at is airbrushed and changed all the time. Yeah. Mo Monica, is that clip by any chance the the Dove uh, commercial that was out about maybe like ten years ago? No, it's uh, Lisa. What's her name? Lisa Gibbons. Um, I can't remember her name. She was a blonde girl that used to do some like you know like not, like a special on a Sunday night. I can't remember what she did. Lisa Gibbons, maybe. I, I can't Lisa remember. Lisa yeah. Gibbons. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me. 
Yeah, it reminds me so much of the, there was a Dove campaign a while. It was something about yeah. beauty only being skin deep, and it was a it was a time elapsed video of a oh. woman having her makeup done and right. be, that going all through the makeup and then going through all the photoshopping and all that, and then the final ad that ended up going on to, on the billboard. And it's really shocking to you know, and and just I can imagine that that would have a similar effect on on young kids and young girls. Yeah, that, the other that's, one that's cool to show is the. Um, Jamie Lee Curtis did that shoot several years ago where she did a, a magazine, like, you know, I don't know, there's probably six or seven pictures of her that are, she asked to be all not airbrushed. So it shows her with, you know, cellulite. And it was shortly after, maybe five years after, um, that movie came out. What's that movie with her with Arnold Schwarzenegger where she's... Um, Looking very toned and... True Lies, yeah, True Lies. And so then she decided to do a shoot where she showed what she looked like with no makeup, without her hair done, with no airbrushing, in just normal underwear, all that kind of stuff. And she wanted to do it because I think she has a daughter. I can't remember how old she is, but she didn't want to do the same thing, to have people see what you really look like without all the stuff that Hollywood, you know, does or the magazines do. Yeah. So that kind of stuff is really important, I think, for girls especially to see as they're growing up so that they can keep that in their head when they're... But it seems like with the media blitz of, you know, the magazines that it seems like it's almost like, like you said, you feel powerless sometimes to really get in there and make a difference. Although I'm sure that you're catching, that you're catching some, like you're planting seeds for some of these young, young girls, which is great because they will remember that. They'll say to themselves, you know, at some point, and some of them, it might not affect them positively or they might but that some of them will say I hey, remember that that and when I was in high school I watched that and that these women aren't reality you know and I would argue that the the models that are being paid for you know in uh, in the magazine advertising it's actually one probably one hundredth of one percent of, of women in the world that actually <laughs> look like that actually look like that um and that kind of um we found this great article. Jessica found it for us. Um, it's the Levi's ad, the controversy. Yeah, I saw so that. that. Yeah, and so it just this is a brand new Levi's ad, and Jessica, being in the Bay Area, it's very applicable because Levi's is Levi's right there. Yeah. Yep, San Francisco-based company. And right. so, Jessica, do you want to jump in and talk a little bit about um, the controversy because it definitely sparked a lot of in terms of the models that were used in the ad. Sure. Uh, so, so this has been quite a, a topic of discussion out here, uh, especially in the Bay Area, because like you said, Levi's is headquartered out here. Um, and a lot of people have either worked for this company or they're very loyal to this brand. Um, and they're known for being such a, a forward thinking organization in so many different ways. And then they come out with this ad for their, for their uh, latest line, Curve ID Jeans. So they're for uh, curvier ladies or the more politically correct terminology. I guess you would say for uh, women of all different sizes because we're not all size twos. And so their ad comes out with the slogan or, or the tagline, hotness comes in all shapes and sizes. So, so for our listeners, I'll just give you a picture. For our listeners who haven't seen this ad, um, there's then th profiles of three women uh, in ponytails wearing jeans. And so you can sort of see their silhouettes. And they're only slightly different from each other. Um, yeah. There's one of them that's a size zero, and then maybe a two, and maybe a, maybe not even a four. <laughs> maybe I not thought they were triples. When I first looked at it, I thought they all right. looked exactly the same. So I couldn't even understand what the ad was talking about because they all looked right. exactly They're, the same. Yep, some of the women are a little more bustier, and some have yeah. a little bigger behind than, than the others. But you're right, Monica, they pretty much all look the same. <laughs> so, yeah. what, what, so people are starting to ask... What do you mean hotness comes in all shapes and sizes? You put three women that look identical to each other on this right. app. Is this a mistake? <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and has Levi's had to um, come back? Do they have any like defense, uh, any um, public defense of this? Yeah, from what I've heard, they've they've basically just come out and acknowledged the fact that it was misinterpreted. Um, that that's not that's not what they meant. Then I think their one of their reps said something like that that it no, by no means is the advertising representative of all women's body types across the globe. Um, adding that a more diverse gallery of real women exists on their Facebook page. So I think they're just a little bit taken back at the moment, trying to figure out how to how to respond to the frenzy of of comments that they've been getting about this. Yeah, I bet. I mean, wow. I it just it, it, in order to. Um, 
you know, it, I'm sure if listeners Google Levi's ad, um, hotness comes in all shapes and sizes. And or the controversy, you can you'll actually get a, a visual of the ad because um, it is it is they do look like they're almost three identical bodies like <laughs> when you look quickly. So yeah. interesting. So I guess Monica, jumping back to you, um, I, I I don't I don't know. I think like when it comes to your, I guess I'm I'm tempted to talk about adolescent girls because that's really where it begins, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I felt that when I thought, thought about this topic, I thought, well, you know, how young does it go? Well, it, it probably goes all the way down possibly to what age, you know, age eight. Or um, I, I, I did read that, that there are clothing lines that sell, you know, quote unquote, sexy clothes. Uh, and, you know, sexy obviously is a um, is up for debate, you know, what, what, how to define that, but that they go as low as 6X um, that some of these clothes are, and that, which is what size my daughter takes. She's a six-year-old girl. She takes size 6X. Um, and then I was thinking, you know, so let's say it may start as early as eight years old and it goes all the way up to maybe 98 years old. I, I was saying before the show that I have a, um, a, a, a grandmother that's um, going on 101 and I think she's, wow. probably, she, yeah, she's probably beyond the body image. Um, she's probably not thinking about body image anymore, <laughs> but really, I mean, at this point, but who knows? I mean, it's really can be, a, and, and Monica, again, you see this in your work. It can be a lifelong struggle. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I have clients that are, you know, in their thirties. I remember this one woman that I trained years ago and she, you know, I mean, all the women that I train, whether they're in their twenties, thirties, forties, whatever, they're not happy with their body image. That's why they're hiring a personal trainer and trying to, you know, perfect themselves even more to where they do feel happy. And, um, you know, obviously some of them go to the extent of surgery and different things. And this one woman had had liposuction on her, you know, hips and butt and thighs. And she came to me like six months afterwards and she said, she was just mortified. She said, I don't know what to do. And she lifted up the back of her shirt and she had cellulite all over her back. And mm -hmm. she said, and the reason is, is because if you take out fat cells and you don't change your eating habits, your body has to store fat somewhere. So it will just shift and store fat in a different place wherever the fat cells are. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she's, she's running from this, trying to get to a place where she is happy with herself. But the problem is, is that people, you know, you can't escape that. You can't escape the way your body just genetically is. If you carry, you know, most women either that apple or pear shape, they either carry their fat in their torso or they carry it down on their hips and butt and thighs and I think probably the biggest thing um, that I would say from working with teenagers and just from being, you know, a kid myself is that if we can try to teach kids from a young age that people do come in all different shapes and sizes and that that can't be changed, you know, so that I remember one of the most empowering things my own mom said to me was my friend Erica, you know, when we were little, she's we always had these tiny little thin legs and, and in the 80s I, we would wear miniskirts and I always wanted a miniskirt to look on me like it looked on Erica. And so I thought if I ate less or exercised more, yeah. whatever, I could look just like her. And I remember being completely oblivious to the fact at that point that that I thought that that was achievable. And my mom just looked at me and said, you were born the way you were born, and your legs are always going to be bigger and more muscular than Erica's. You will never look exactly the same no matter what you do. So you have to love your body for the way it is and wear things that show off your assets and really appreciate how uniquely different you are, but you can't go at, go at it trying to look exactly like somebody else because you never will. And it was just kind of that opening moment for me that I was just empowered by thinking, oh, okay, well, then now I don't have to struggle and try so hard for something that's unattainable. Right. But I think if we can start with kids at a young age and really show them, you know, really talking about the things that are beautiful about them, whether it's their eye color. Well, first of all, it should, you know, first and foremost, I think with all children, you should be talking about the intrinsic or internal qualities of them that are fantastic, which is what's going to give them a lot, you know, better self-esteem. But if we're talking about the physical being, being able to tell them, well, you have fantastic arms or you have strong, whatever, you know, talking about all of their assets so that we're not drawing attention to having to look exactly like what they're seeing, you know, when it comes across the screen or magazines and that kind of stuff. And be, being much more realistic from a really young age, I think, would be really helpful for kids. I've got just a couple quick um, studies about uh, focusing on adolescent girls. Um, uh, the messages of the media, permanent, you know, obviously permeate through the whole of society. Um, including to boys, you know, adolescent boys and, and, and women of all ages, men of all ages. But um, it's really the girls, the adolescent girls are often targeted by media and social body image ideals and are more likely to suffer negative 
health outcomes associated with their body and the dissatisfaction of their body. So the three quick things I read was, according to a survey of of teenage girls, the media was identified as the primary source of information about health issues. Like, so the media is the primary source of info, which for, for you, Monica, being a high school health teacher, you know, again, you're kind of fighting an uphill battle some, in some ways. Um, the second one was that a study of mass media magazines revealed that women's magazines had 10 times more advertisements and articles promoting weight loss than a men's magazine. So, you know, and that's, that study's like, about, that was about 15 years ago. So, and that hasn't changed <laughs> from what I've seen. And then the last one, though, which is a more recent study, was that um, music videos, watching music, vid- music videos may be a risk factor for increased perceived importance of appearance and increased weight concerns among adolescent girls. Mm-hmm. So that was a study that was done recently about music. So, that, which is interesting because, like, really, if you think about it, music videos are. I mean, they they spent the kids spend a lot of time watching that. So, Monica, I didn't know if you had any, um, if you you know wh- whether as a as a trainer or as a teacher, if you have anything specific that you know that girls have have said or just a general gist that you've gotten about that. I don't know that I have in response to just you know um, with teenage girls. I don't know that I have a lot of. Uh, evidence about specific media stuff or music videos and that kind of stuff. I think the most often when I worked, or the most common thing I hear of girls that are anorexic that I work with is that they started because of a comment that their brother or dad said. That was the most oh. common thing that I had. So that there was some um, either a comment or like a sarcastic comment or just teasing or you know just jokes even made about their weight from a brother or dad growing up, and that kind of set the ball rolling of not accepting themselves. Wow. And um, so, and not so a that, boyfriend, you know, though. Not a boyfriend, but a brother or a family, a male family. Yes, member. yeah, more of a, more of a. I think probably because of family members, it starts at even a, an even younger age. You know, I don't know that girls necessarily love these days. They might be having boyfriends in sixth, seventh, eighth grade. But you know, a lot of times, you know, those girls don't have boyfriends yet, but they do have brothers and dads that may make a joking comment. You know, and and a lot. And I think most of the time it is a joke. You know, but it's. I even notice it was. You know, I think this is an issue that shouldn't. I, mean, I know you. Sh- your show is geared towards women, but I don't think the the issue is um, exclusive to women. I think that men have a lot of the same body image, you know, um, insecurities, and I think that starts from a young age as well. And I notice with my own boys, we'll insult each other and call each other chubby or that kind of thing, and they take it pretty personally sometimes, you know. And so I think that I think that most of the time this is rooted in a really uh, familial kind of young age kind of thing. But I think then as they as they look to what they want to look like, they're looking at the media, and that is exacerbating the problem for them because, you know, it's not realistic what they're seeing. I know that, well, um, I, I know we're geared towards women in general uh, on, the, on the Crashing Glass podcast, but I find that this, this topic in general of body image seems to always lend... Um, lend to women more than men. I mean, I think of things like you don't see in the media, you don't see trendy body images of of men. You see like women trying to look like Christina Hendricks on Mad Men when that busty that busty physique or or like Adele who she's you know, she's a little bit overweight but she's she's a beautiful beautiful singer and people are trying to kind of be in her form. Where I don't seem to see that a lot with men. Like I don't I I, I don't typically see a um you know a male singer or a performer or or some sort of celebrity being viewed in the same way. Right. That's true. You're right. It's not there's not that strong connection between talent and physical appearance as there is with the women. Yeah. Um, I, would, I, I would agree. Now the back to the, the teenage girls, one of the one it seems like kind of the overarching issue here is that physical appearance becomes a major part of their self esteem and, and their body is a major sense of self. So, again, you know, I know, Monica, you were referencing that, you know, young boys can also, you know, there's definitely talk and, and they're concerned about their bodies and what they look like and they don't want to be overweight or, uh, but it's not the kind of, I, I don't, I don't think that, I think the main difference here is that we do, it's, it, our, it's, it's our self-esteem is tightly woven or interconnected with with our physical appearance and our bodies as a, who we are, our sense of self. And it, I don't think the men are socialized that way. Um, so, you know, again, going back to, like, not that we have to find someone, some, something to blame 
um, we blame the media a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it just, but I think like you said about the comments that maybe are said within a family have more, um, hold more weight than maybe parents even under, even realize. Oh, absolutely. I think it's, I think there's a lot of that damage that comes from the messages with, you know, within the family. And I think that that's, it's really important for parents to know that. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of it too is if you have a grown woman who is still concerned about her body image, like we all are, and we are either looking at ads or we are even making comments about ourselves or our body or um, exercise or eating or just those kinds of things around young girls or boys, then they are getting that from a really young age because they know that that's something that their own mom struggles with, you know. So it's, it's, it's something that I think that adults have to be very careful around, like you said, even with eight-year-olds. I think you can make comments around a two- or three- or four-year-old little girl, she's not going to notice, but pretty soon when they're... You know, like your daughter and mine is close to six or seven or eight, and they're starting to really look to you to see what it's like. You know, what does it mean to be a woman? What do I want to look like? Then you have to be really careful about the comments that you're making in the home because that's going to start filtering into the psyche of the little girl who is looking to you to know what is beautiful or, you know, what is accepted or what is what you're striving for. So I think a lot of this has to come – a lot of the change would – be empowered by starting it in the home and educating parents of how they can make a difference to their kids so that when they do, are, when their kids are exposed to media and all those things, that they are on a solid foundation and have a strong, you know, body image and good messaging at home and really good self-confidence going into it so that that doesn't matter as much as it does to kids who, you know, are affected much more by their parents' comments and stuff in a negative way at a young age before they see all that stuff on TV and music ads and all that kind of stuff. Or to just try to counteract some of that, you know, with with good, I don't want to say good parenting because I certainly don't want to put any more pressure on parents yeah. um, to have yeah. an ideal, but to just be open open parenting. And, you yeah. know, when I, when I step on the scale in my bathroom, um, I, if, if anyone's, if my kids are around, I sometimes stop and think, you know, I don't want my, well, either of them, but specifically my, especially my daughter, to see me getting on the scale every day. I mean, that's something that I may choose to do <laughs> at this point of my life, for, for, for better or worse, but no, but I, I mean, I don't want her to get the impression that that is of dire importance. So I, I think it's, it seems like the modeling, the non, some of the nonverbal stuff too is, is tremendously more um, it leaves a lot more of an impression than the, even the verbal. Would you, would either of you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think definitely. I think that that's you know, I think it's all about modeling and and the, the silence, the absence of saying negative things about or anything about your own body around kids is probably going to allow them to not be so tied into thinking that that's a really important thing themselves. You know, if you're talking more about the things that they do or the things that they think are all of those and, and yourself as well, all the things that you enjoy, your passions, your hobbies, all those things that you're focusing on instead of what you look like, then they're, they're, they're never going to get that message that how you look is so important. To who you are. Yeah. Right. What I want to know is the secret, what the, what the, the kids under the age of eight <laughs> have and what the yeah. adults over the age of 100 or over the age of 98, going back to Jill's uh, saying, 8 to 98, what, what is it that they have that are, are, are making them not even concerned about this? Right. Oblivion. <laughs> Oblivion, <laughs> probably from under six. <laughs> I hate to say it, but a lot of it's sexuality. You know, I mean, I think that... I think so much, as soon as you become a sexual being or you're starting to become a sexual being in puberty and stuff, you're, a lot of why you want to look good has to do with you wanting to be desirable in a sexual way. And I think when you get older, you know, then I don't know if it's 98 or 88 or, you know, maybe it's different for different people, but I think at a certain point at that age, you probably kind of lose that part of your sexual being. You're not necessarily sexually active anymore or that that's not an important part of, you know, your daily or weekly um, self, sense of self. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's why, as you, when you get older, it just it doesn't matter as much. I don't know. It's an interesting question. Maybe we should so interview some of the uh, well, elderly people. Right. And see what it is. <laughs> that's what I don't know if the young one will give us any good answers, but the older ones might. Right. We're stuck in the middle. The three of us are stuck in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's so, something that we all struggle with, you know, all the time. It's a daily battle, I think, for me at least. It's a daily battle to um, to do things that make you feel good and make you, you know, make you feel like 
you are, it's, it's, uh, it's on a lot of levels, I think. It's, you know, feeling good the way you look when you're presenting yourself in your job. It's to other female friends. It's, you know, to your mate or partner in a sexual way. It's, it's, I mean, it's just a very woven part of who you are in all, all across the gamut. But it's a daily thing that, you know, it affects how you feel and how you look at a, the physical part of you, I think, really affects your mental psyche and your mood. It and does. So it's a really hard thing to escape, I guess. Yeah, that's when I get. That's why I get so worried about ads like this Levi's one is because it's not. It isn't representative, whether they meant it to be or not. It isn't representative of of women and what we're supposed to look like and what we all look like. I mean, but unless you want to go back to the whole health food thing, I mean, we shouldn't be over, overweight or too underweight because then it's not healthy. Right. Yeah. You know, Jessica, I just wanted to, and I, and I know that our, our fabulous guest has just a couple more minutes, um, so I'm going to let her say it a little bit more, but I, I just wanted to say that it's such an interesting, you know, that the both, both of you just brought up that it's this underweight versus overweight, and that just, it is so connected to our daily, um, our, our mental, right, our, like, our, I don't know, happiness might be too, too strong or too, but, but our, our, just our daily psyche, you know, our, how we feel, and I know for me, um, my weight does not um, shift too much, you know, uh, maybe a few pounds in each up and down here and there. But I know that there have been times in the last couple years where I'll say, okay, well, and now I'm down a few pounds. Okay, great. My legs are thinner than I was six when I'm six pounds higher, right? My legs do look, thighs look a little thinner, um, even at six or seven pounds difference. But mm-hmm. when you get under, when I get to that point, then... I feel like um, that, like, my veins, like, in my, you know, like, um, it's almost like, you know, that look that Angelina Jolie has, which I don't like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like, her veins, like, the veins in your arms um, show, are, are more, because you've lost a little bit of fat, and you your legs look better, but your arms look worse. And so, it's <laughs> like, it is literally, like, I think, Monica, you just said it so well, a daily, it's a daily struggle. Like, where, where is this happy medium, and why, why can't, how, why, why is it so hard to get there? I think it's also that whole thing of, you know, wherever you put fat on first, you take it off last. And so, like you're saying, if you if your thighs are a part of your body that you want to be thinner and so you lose weight and you get, your, you get that last part of your body to where you actually feel accepting of your body, then other parts of your body might get too skinny. So, like most of us, we lose our breasts, right? When you lose right. weight, you get flatter there, and that's not necessarily what you want either, but you're doing, you're losing weight all over, but the last place to come off is the place that's usually your trouble spot. So is then, that a, that's know, a scientific uh, or a, yeah. yeah, yeah, there's it's lipogenic and lipolytic enzymes and the ones that lipogenic fat storing, lipolytic is fat releasing, you always have more of the lipogenic than you do of the lipolytic. So the parts of your body that store it quickest are also the last place that it's going to come off. Right. And so I think, you know, I, that's, yeah, it's, I think that goes back to, again, you know, recognizing what your body type is and accepting that from a young age and saying, you know what, it's okay that my thighs are a little bit bigger or my, you know, for other women, maybe it's that their chest or midsection is bigger and their limbs are thinner. You have to just be accepting of what, you know, God or whoever gave us and really appreciate the strength and the things that your body can do so that you're not trying to achieve something that makes you, you know, miserable on a daily basis or makes you look unproportioned because you're trying to achieve that one part of your body to be perfect. Right. It doesn't really work. But. Yeah. Well, perfection is another another subject. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for another day. But yeah. then we I've got to jump off, Jill and Jessica, but thank you so much for letting me be a part of it today. Yes. Thank you for your expertise, Monica. Thanks, Monica. Okay. Bye, Jessica. Bye, Jill. Bye. Jessica, so I wanted to go right to you and, and, and ask you about the the idea of perfection uh, in young in girls and and. and going in that that's like I mean that could be that could be another whole podcast because I do think I know. That, you know that 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 is more that anxiety of you know is more common in women than than men but I wanted to ask you about um you know just sort of that the, the what Monica was just saying is that the idea of being happy with where you know with where you're at and if I don't know just among your peers and and people you work with or you know that you see I mean how, what what is your take on that um, I think that that if if you're ter- t- talking in t- in terms of um, 
physical characteristics, I think it's a little different than weight, too. Like, I think they're totally different subjects. Like, someone who wants to get plastic surgery because their nose isn't proportional to the rest of their face um, versus somebody who has an eating disorder because they, you know, it's more controllable. You can, you, you know, you can control it at home. I don't know. I think they're totally different things, and, but they all they all go back to Selfish. women just not being confident and comfortable with their own bodies. And I think that that's where it really starts. Right. Which is why, I, I, I mean, I think it's in, imperative to focus on the young girls because it yeah. does, like, I found one other quick, com- you know, another quick study that did, it was the one that I had read earlier about the, the sexy clothes are available in as, uh, as small a size as a children's six X. Um, yeah. But it seems that um, that what I read was that the, getting the message that um, uh, first and second, they've done studies on of grade school girls, and even in first grade, girls think the culture is telling them that they should model themselves after celebrities. Um, and, you know, we've got, and, and, and really in, in my, I mean, this is more for Gen Y, I think really is like the Britney Spears and, the, and now like with um, Miley Cyrus, and, and, mm-hmm. and thank God we have... Uh, a country singer who's gone mainstream. <laughs> She's, <laughs> I can't think of her name right now. Um, Taylor Swift. Oh, Taylor she, Swift. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, but she is a great. It seems that she's a great role model. In that, I mean, she is a a thin woman, but she but she doesn't seem like she's as caught up in the the sex being super sexual all the time compared yeah. to like a Britney Spears. Yeah, definitely. I think that I, I, I really think that there's something to this. And I, I know that Monica made a really good point that this isn't just exclusive to, to young girls or to women in general, um, that, that this is a problem amongst uh, males as well. But I, I just feel that it's much more pronounced um, among women than, than it is males, especially when you've got the, the celebrity, the trendiness of certain body styles and body shapes and the way certain clothes fit on you and the way it just, it doesn't seem to me that it's, that it's very, it's a little more top heavy in terms of when, when it comes to women than, than men. Right. I can't think of any, I can't think of any situations or, that I've heard of recently in the media or even historically of male body image issues. Right. I, I know. I, I, I mean, I know that it's out there and I just think that it's a difference. And this is something that I would love to research, like really research. And, and I, I hopefully someday, someday soon I will. But yeah. why, why is it so, you know, why? I feel like a, a man who's 20 pounds overweight and, and I've seen this happen, which is why mm-hmm. I mean it's just a you know an incidental thing that I have you know that I've seen but they look in the, they can look in the mirror and be yep. like wow I look pretty good you know and there and I you know I, but a little bit of you know maybe a little extra here but I look pretty <laughs> good I'm I'm 20 pounds you know or, or what you know but but if you take if you line up to a man and a woman who are both you know roughly the in the same kind of shape you know and and then you, you so you have a guy who's really given himself the benefit of the doubt, and I'm, I guess I feel like we can generalize that 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 happens a lot. And then the same a, a woman looking in the mirror who is twenty pounds over, you know what, what her what her doctor would say is the ideal weight for her, uh, she's just horrified, you know, and just feels <laughs> so inadequate. And meanwhile, the man's like, you know, kind of look feeling like he's looking good, and he's like, oh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> He's got the big belly, and that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, maybe, um, maybe I'm over over generalizing, but I feel like um, it's really it's hard. It's it's hard to be it's hard to be a woman in in some ways, you know, in this way. And it's it's really hard to be a teenage girl. And and I think that's why I felt this was such a great topic to talk about. Um, yeah. You know, and, and, and having a health teacher that was able to, you know, give us a little bit of input. And, and when we do post about this podcast, I, I, will, I will find that Dove commercial that you mentioned because I remember that. And I think it's actually even less than 10 years. It might have been just five years or so ago. Yeah, I think um, my timing's off a little bit. But I, I remember that. And I remember actually I was working on my, my, uh, my master's degree at the time. And my teacher, one of my professors, used it in, as an example in class and nobody had seen it at that point so it must have been fairly new and I just remember it was it was the it was the topic that we had the most discussion on out of all my classes that semester right um and what was the name of the class that they discussed it in 
Um, I, it was a, it was a media and communication. So it was the, it was <laughs> like what we're talking about today, the impact of the media on people's social behavior. Right. Right. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Well, that's a good, you know, I think we've covered, I think we've done a nice job of covering um, a lot about media and women and body image. And, and I think it was helpful. I, I did, I did read another thing that I read today of, um, that was like a, um, kids and teens self-esteem page, you know, like a not-for-profit kind of web page about with some information for parents. And, and it did say just what Monica said about when, with her experience with being a high school health teacher is that family, the family environment and the family comments and the positive influence of siblings and, and the parents to these girls is very important and can cut into or help to s- somewhat diminish the, the media message that may be more negative or affecting the girls negatively. Yeah, or at least counteract it. There should always be a counter, counter argument. Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think we should, this is great. I think that we, um, and I think that, you know, I loved how you brought up Jessica about the, the idea that what do the, well, you know, the, un, the kids, the, the young girls, the young kids that are less than, you know, seven and under, you know, they really are, they have, they're still so centered on, them, like just themselves and which is an important development stage <laughs> to go through and they they're so they are sort of you know still not aware of the, everything around them but what is it about you know where when do you reach that point where you know what about my 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 own nana who is you know a centur- centurion now and unbelievable <laughs> <laughs> and but she's you know she she's i'm going to say that she's not, hasn't worried about her own her own body image probably for a good 10 years or so yeah Um, and so what you know what is it that they have you know that we don't have I I think that was a really neat kind of a philosophical question that you proposed I and I love how I love how Monica had an answer right away for that too and she was like oh well I think it has to do with sexuality and you think about it you think about the young girl blossoming into her own sexuality and figuring herself out and, you know, at the root of it to attract a mate. And then as you get older, you realize the woman goes through menopause and she's no longer of childbearing age anymore. And so that kind of diminishes off on that end. So you've got this this sort of climactic thing going on. But it's really funny. She, I would have never thought of it that way because my grandmother, who um, in her later years, she, she didn't make it to 101. Bless your, bless your Nana. Yeah. Um, she, made it, she made it to almost 80. And I remember at the very end, and her health was declining, and she was in a nursing home, and she would have, she would never, ever, ever go without getting her hair dyed. She uh. had to have her hair dyed. She uh, was an Italian woman who, you know, wouldn't admit that she ever had a gray hair on her head. She uh. had jet black hair. <laughs> you know, uh, all the way to gray. 80. Yeah. All the way until the very end. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe there's something to that. But, you know, maybe I think she still was up until the end still trying to pick up men in the nursing home. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope she was. <laughs> um, well, this is great. I'm glad we were able to, you know, this is a huge topic, a very, you know, very, lots of lots of different things. Lots of research has been done, and um, but I think it was nice. We, we might have just scratched the surface, but it, I think it was a nice thing to discuss today. Um, and to segue over, Jessica, I know that we, we have a little bit of chick news for this week. Um, lots of women in the news this week, but we picked a couple important things. Jessica, do you want to talk about Cecile Richards? Sure. Um, so if you haven't heard her name before, to our, to our listeners, if you don't recognize her name, um, Cecile Richards is actually the president of Planned Parenthood. She's been the president since 2006. Now you might be saying, oh yeah, I think I heard her name uh, a few months back ago when Planned Parenthood was having their funding uh, yanked from um, some organizations out there, namely the Susan G. Komen Foundation, um, which we know has been reversed. But Cecile is back in the news because uh, there is a law that is about to be, or excuse me, about to go into effect on Wednesday of this coming week um, that will block funding for Planned Parenthood again in the state of Texas. Um, so Cecile is back out there trying to get the word out and, and talking about um, the benefits of Planned Parenthood and her organization and um, sort of her take on on why these efforts to block funding for for her organization and the uh, and the great things that it does for for women in this country and beyond um, why why those laws are not so good. 
Right. Well, um, it, I'm fascinated with this, um, what they're kind of calling a, a sexual counter-revolution. Um, yes. There's the Planned Parenthood, Susan G. Komen, part of it. And then there's the, you know, President Obama and the birth control for um, private health. I mean, I'm sorry, public, you know, like health um, insurance and whether they should be covering with birth control for women. And then there's another another Texas law that has been passed that is requiring women who go in to have an abortion, they have to, they are required to have an ultrasound now so that they, that they can see, they are required to see the, the fetal heartbeat or hear the heart, fetal heartbeat and to actually see the image um, of the fetus on the screen. And oh, that's be cool. interesting. So before, yeah. so before they make, go through with the procedure, yeah. they have yeah. to actually hear the heartbeat and all that stuff? Right, right. And wow. that's, that's the state of Texas. There's other states as well. Um, Virginia was one, but I think they actually reversed it. But Texas recently, it, it was actually, it, it's actually the um, subject, too, of a Doonesbury, Gary Trudeau, um, he wrote a Doonesbury comic about it, it kind of, because he's a very liberal, um, you know, writer, and he po- he put it in Doonesbury about um, that Texas law. So, mm-hmm. you know, it just seems like the sexual, you know, the, I, I think of it as like the Rush Limbaugh. I feel like if there, if there was the word sexual, the words um, sexual counter-revolution make me just think of an image of Rush Limbaugh's head. <laughs> Because I feel like it's really growing, and it's got a lot of weight behind it, you know, I mean, um, literally and figuratively, <laughs> no, it's got a lot behind <laughs> it, and and it's just, it, it would be something that I actually think, um, if you would um, like to come on again and be our guest uh, in a future podcast for Crashing Glass, I think we actually need to, that's a topic that we should do very soon, I'm hoping in the next couple weeks. Yeah, that would definitely be a big one. And, you know, I would really like to talk about it more um, because I know just chicks, chick news is is a limited (laughs) end of the show format, but a feature. But uh, yeah, it's just, I I don't know. I just have a lot of opinions about this. And, you know, if you, for our listeners, if you Google Cecile Richards, you'll see she's, she was on the Daily Show last week. She's been on CNN recently. She's done a couple of other interviews. And her thing is, it's like, she's like, stop, you know, stop focusing on the abortion part of it. You know, this religious and political tug of war back and forth. The the main purpose of, of Planned Parenthood and the good and the benefit that it's doing is that it's giving health care to women that ne- necessarily may not financially be able to afford it. So a lot of times that these women go into the to Planned Parenthood facility, that's the only time they ever see a doctor. So right. that's that's a benefit in itself. So maybe, you yeah. know, maybe we have to look at the system and, and wonder, you know, maybe that's what it's missing. Why do we have to focus on that one, right? And, and, and also Planned Parenthood may be the only place that they can get Birth, affordable birth control so they have some control over yep. their future right mm-hmm. isn't that the whole point <laughs> yep it's it, the preventive the preventive care that's that's supposed to be the most important yeah and and having women having to be control and to if they want to and become possibly you know possibly higher earners and uh, contributing to society in all sorts of ways that well again we can this this is a topic <laughs> so but no I'm, I'm so I'm so um appreciative that you brought up the Cecile Richards, the president of Planned Parenthood, because there's a lot of different, uh, it's just, it seems to be there's a lot of buzz going on about this yep. sexual, like I said, this kind of um, counter revolution. Mm-hmm. That's, it's like, it's very different from what happened in the 70s when it kind of was the 60s and 70s of the, the sexual revolution where right. women finally got some, some freedom over the, of, you know, over their own bodies. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Now, I'm going to jump to one other Chick News um, segment before we wrap up today, which is, um, it's just something that struck me yesterday when I was walking through the um, pharmacy. I glanced at the New York Times, and on the front page of the New York Times was a very, a a photo, a a close-up photo of Angela Merkel, who is the um, Chancellor of Germany. The, the head of Germany, and then Christine Lagarde, who is the uh, managing director of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. And it was these two women, and it was them in profile because they were sitting side by side at a meeting um, uh, dealing with Europe and um, the emergency funds that they need to, you know, be raising to help out with, you know, with Greece and with the pro- economic problems. But 
but just the fact that it was, and they, they are, the reason why it was a, a big story and on the front page of the Times was because they are split. They are disagreeing over how to handle it and how much money they need, um, you know, to, to well, with the debt. They're kind of disagreeing on the, the best strategy. But the fact that it was, you know, this Christine Lagarde, who's a French woman, and she's on a collision course now with with uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel. I just thought that here are two women. You know, they're they're all you know older, established, intelligent women, and they're on. They, here they are making these huge decisions about you know the future of European and you know the economy. And they are. It's 2012, and it's it's about time. <laughs> and, I know. And it, well, it just what it, what it is is I don't mean even to say, what I mean is is that it's just. Uh, it made me stop because it, 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 if it was two men and it was like, you know, a president, a European president and, and the IMF chair a few years ago, you know, I wouldn't have stopped to yep. look at it. But because it was them and I looked and, they, and they're in disagreement and they're split, you know, I just thought it was a very, uh, really poignant moment for me to stop and look at the times and say, wow, those, there are two powerful women and I wanted to bring them up this week. I think that's great. And I think what's cool about that is that they're being taken very, very seriously. I'm, you know, the headline wasn't cat fight or, you know, something, <laughs> something kitschy along those lines. It was very, it's, this is serious stuff. And uh, yes, very powerful women are, are, are at the helm. They are, they are. And it's, it's, it's hard. What do they say? It's hard won, right? Hard fought and hard won. But I think we're here. We still have a lot of body image things to work out. We have still have some kinks to work out. But I think that um, we're making progress. And Jessica Moskowitz, it was so great to have you out from the Bay Area and to have your insight and your intelligence on our show this week. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Jill. It was great chatting with you. And, uh, and our guest, Monica, was fantastic. She was, yes. Um, and we will be, we will talk to you, I'm sure, have you on very soon. And so for another week, we have minus Holly Hurley, but we'll have her back for the very next podcast next um, for next week's show. And we miss her very much, and we hope her tra- safe travels home from China. Um, and we'll be back. And But signing off for our Fashion Class podcast for the week, this is Jill Hembley. Thank you. that you're bleeding I'm choking up now to swim